Welcome to the hills. I greet all of our large online community around the world, all of you in person in Keller, West Fort Worth, uh, North Richmond Hills, and our launch team in Dallas. Happy New Year, the first Sunday of a new year. And it takes on special meaning for us at the Hills because most of you know we have a five-year church vision as we ask for nations and generations. So we are beginning the third of year of that five-year vision. And the very first goal in that vision was to see 1,825 people over the course of five years accept Christ, surrender to him, and be baptized. And uh, that is, averages one person a day for five years. So can we take a moment and celebrate how God blessed us? Last year, 2023, we saw 437 people <laughs> surrender to Christ and be baptized. Thank you, Lord, and we ask for more. We are actually, for the first two years, just above that goal of one person a day. Well, vision is the way a church pursues mission. The vision might change. The mission never does. And we feel like Jesus made the mission very clear to make and grow followers. And so this series I'm preaching in January is one of the most important I'll ever preach for the future of our church. If we catch the idea I'm going to try to teach for this month, we will meet the goals of that vision. We're going to talk about what it means to follow Jesus. So I'm going to begin by reading some of the words of Jesus from the Gospel of Mark. I want you to follow along with me. Oh, and by the way, I learned something cool over Christmas. The Bible has now come out in print. How cool is that? You don't have to squint anymore on your phone or your tablet. You can actually buy a book and read the Bible. And that's what I'm going to do. Starting in Mark 1, verse 16. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake. For they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. Let's turn over to chapter 2, verse 13. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. Let's turn over to chapter 8. And the single verse that might be the most important of all in understanding what Jesus means by this word. It's verse 34. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And one last verse in chapter 10, a moral young religious man approaches Jesus about how to be sure about his relationship with God. And we read in verse 21, Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. To my knowledge, not one time in the gospels does Jesus ever ask anyone to accept him. He invited everyone to follow him. And so you hear us say almost weekly at our church, the Hills Church exists to make and grow followers of Jesus. What I want to do, though, this month is explain what do we mean by and what did Jesus mean by that word follow? Now, that leads, of course, to one of the greatest scenes of one of the greatest movies of all time. I'm talking, of course, about The Princess Bride. And in that scene, Vinzini, who's been hired to kidnap the Princess Bride, is being chased by a masked man they cannot elude. And he keeps saying the word, inconceivable. And Diego Montoya utters that great line. You keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. And I'm going to suggest that that is how 
many of us in the church today are using the word follow. We know the mission. We can't change the mission. Jesus commission to his church is to go to every ethnic group on the earth and make disciples. Please understand, he did not send us out to make decisions. Here's the problem. The way the word follow is used in the church today in too many places, it's been redefined to mean make a decision to accept Jesus and agree with some basic propositional truths about him. The gospel is presented as an offer of a transaction more than a call to transformation. In other words, accept some things about Jesus and get a ticket to go to heaven when you die. Instead of follow Jesus and embrace a new way to live. Now, when the gospel and when the word follow becomes accept some ideas instead of embrace a way of living, what we wind up making is people that really like Jesus, but aren't trying to be like Jesus. Let's be honest. In most of the Western church today, you can be a Christian and you do not have to follow Jesus. The crisis the church faces today is a crisis of formation. It is a crisis of what Christians say they believe and how they actually live. Churches don't mean to contribute to this crisis, but here's what happens. You see, we live in an extremely consumeristic culture. Almost any organization in our culture thrives by offering services that consumers want. It's not our fault that we live in this culture, but it affects everything, even churches. And churches unintentionally get sucked into a way of thinking, even though they have good intentions. Let me explain. I read a book a few years ago by a man named Will Mancini called Future Church, and he asked the question, why do most people choose a church? He gave four reasons, and I think he's right. Place, personality, programs, and people. We choose a church because of the location. It's near us, we like that. Or we choose a church because of a personality. A pastor or a youth minister or a worshiper has some charisma or a fine character. We, we choose a church because of programs. We like the kids' ministry or we need a support group or some other way that we get ministered to. Or people, we like a church because we have really good friends there. All of those are good reasons. All of those are understandable reasons. And Mancini calls these four reasons the lower room and they matter and we need to give attention to them and because they're the easiest to measure it's where churches put most of their budget and most of their staff attention here's the thing every metric in the lower room can change a church can move its location a pastor can move away a program can stop friends can go to another city now what shouldn't change is that church's commitment to make and grow followers of Jesus. Now, Mancini calls that the upper room. He says it should be the aim of every church and all church leaders to get people who've come to a church for those lower room reasons to eventually move up into that upper room where they're passionate about following Jesus. Here's the problem. We're talking about transformation. And it's so much harder to measure success in the upper room than in the lower room. Here's what I mean. I can measure how many people attended a conference or how much money was given to a special offering. But how do you measure transformation? Could you imagine me the first Sunday of a new year saying, good news, church. According to our data, we are up 17% in joy. And we're up 13% in kindness. But we need to work on self-control. We went down 12% in self-control last year. See, you can't measure the fruit of the Spirit. 
And so we don't mean this to happen, but we just drift into really running a good lower room. That's why people came anyway, and that's what we can measure. And we stopped really prioritizing moving people to the upper room. So here's what happens. We don't mean for it to happen, but we wind up producing consumers instead of followers. It's the goal of our church to make and grow followers of Jesus and to have a strategy, a way that we've thought through of how we can do that well. That's why several years ago we introduced a, a, a strategy called Next Steps. We talked a lot about it. So what I'm going to do today is talk about why we're not going to talk about that anymore. <laughs> now, I was a part of creation of Next Steps. A bunch of us on staff, we met every week for over a year. We got our Bibles out. We poured through the Gospels. And we asked the question, what are the kinds of things that Jesus did that people need to do if they're going to follow him? And every step was critical to the transformation journey. The process was prayer bathed. It was Jesus focused. I preached the sermons and I look back at those sermons and I agree with everything I said. <laughs> now let's just get really honest. Our church has not owned or embraced next steps. How many of you could even tell me what the next steps are? I'm including ministers and elders in that question. We put it on the website. We've painted it on the walls. We don't even know what they are. We have seven. I'm going to take a stab. You ready? Worship regularly. Connect to God. Live differently. Do life together. Give generously. Serve others. Tell your one. That was pretty good. Give me a hand. And I believe in every one of those things. But here's what we've learned after evaluating after several years. Number one problem, we got too many steps and we don't have enough. See, we wrestled, how can we boil it down to just seven? And even that's too many for you to remember. But what about the important steps we left out? What about confession? What about fasting? What about honoring Sabbath? We need something smaller than what we have, and we need something bigger than what we have. And here's the other weakness we have found in our approach. We don't mean this to happen, but the temptation when you keep talking about steps is that the steps become an end instead of a means to an end. See, the goal is not to get people to worship regularly, give generously, or even do life together. Because here's the thing. You can read your Bible and tithe and join a group and still be a jerk. <laughs> the goal is Christ-likeness. The goal is people living in that upper room following Jesus. The goal is what Paul put into words in Galatians 4. My dear children, for whom I'm again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. The goal is to take people who came to a church for whatever reason and help equip them to live in such a way that they are looking like and talking like and acting like and reacting like and loving like Jesus. That's what he meant when he said, follow me. And here's the thing, the very first disciples understood better than we do. And let me explain why. So I'm going to take a few minutes now, I'm going to nerd out, it's going to sound like the History Channel, but hang in there, it's going to be worth it, okay? See, Jesus did not invent discipleship. If you were a Jewish boy or girl in the days of Jesus, at about the age of five, you would go to the local synagogue and start school. It was called Bet Sefer, House of the Book. You know why? Because your textbook was the first five books of what we call the Old Testament. The Law of Moses, the Torah. And you would use Torah, you'd learn to read, you'd learn to write, you'd learn to do math. And you'd be in 
house of the book for about seven years, from about age five to about age 12, and then the great lot of you would be sent home. The girls would all be sent home because about age 13 or 14, it was time for them to get married. The boys would be sent home to learn the trade of their father, builder, farmer, fisher. But not all the boys were sent home. The very smartest boys were allowed to stay for the next level of school called Bet Medresh, House of Learning. And you'd spend about five years looking through the rest of what we call the Old Testament. And about age 17, that school would be through, and you would graduate. And all the boys would be sent home, except a few. The best of the best of the best would be grilled by the rabbi. He might ask them, who do you side with, Shema or Hillel, on grounds for divorce? What do you think is the point of the book of Ecclesiastes? Who are the sons of God in Genesis 6? And he would take the best of the best of the best, and he would say to them, come, follow me. Now, this was not a call to be converted. They already believed in God. This was a call to be devoted to that rabbi's yoke. What was a rabbi's yoke? Remember, Jesus said, come take my yoke. A rabbi's yoke was his teaching on how to honor God in God's good world, how to do life the way God wanted life done. And so the understanding was, you are going to now apprentice under your rabbi. What does that mean? It means you're going to be with your rabbi all the time. It means you're going to become like your rabbi, and ultimately, you're going to go and do what your rabbi did. This is so important. Duplication was the destination. When a rabbi said to someone, come, follow me, he was inviting them to become what he was. That's what those fishermen heard when they left everything to follow Jesus. That's why that rich young ruler did not follow Jesus. Because he knew exactly what Jesus was asking. Jesus was asking, come be my apprentice. What does that mean? It means three things. First thing, means you're going to spend time with him. Big amounts of time. Mark 3, Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. To follow Jesus is to be continually conscious of his presence, to abide in him, to be so intimate with the Holy Spirit that you're always aware of Jesus. We'll talk more about this next week, but look at this verse. Jesus said, I'll ask the Father. He'll give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. And so to follow Jesus is to live in such a relationship to the Holy Spirit, you're always aware of Jesus' presence. Second thing Jesus meant by that, you're going to become like him. You're going to increasingly display his character as you take on his yoke, as you start to do life the way Jesus did it. You ever seen this bumper sticker, Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven? Okay, I get it. Let me tell you why I don't like it. Because it unintentionally preaches the transaction version of the gospel. Let me tell you, Christians are a whole lot more than just forgiven. They are formed. They're becoming like their rabbi. And so, Jesus said, the student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. You are training under your rabbi to be like him. This was the intent of the steps. You can call them steps. You can call them disciplines. You can call them practices or habits. But here's what they do. When we confess, when we read scripture, when we pray together, when we live in community, we are creating space 
for the Holy Spirit to do his transforming work so that the fruit of the life of Jesus begins to show up in us. And then, follow me was Jesus' call to learn to do what he did. He called them that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to cast out demons. If I was going to sum up in one sentence, what did Jesus do? Jesus announced and promoted and established a kingdom of light. And he exposed and pushed back a dominion of darkness. And Jesus is recruiting, not seeking acceptance. He is recruiting apprentices to come learn to do what he did, to join the movement. And again, this is going to require a partnership with the Holy Spirit, Acts 1 8, before he sent them out. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Let me say it one more time. Jesus was not seeking acceptance. He was seeking apprentices who want to learn a new way of doing life. Now, this is the upper room. It should be the goal of every church and all church leaders to get the people they shepherd to move into the upper room. So we're just being honest and blunt. We think we can do better at this than we have done. And that is our intention as leaders of the hills. I like the story of the mom who's looking out the window in the backyard. And she sees her six-year-old son, Johnny, reading the Bible to the family cat. She thinks, how cute. I'm not going to disturb him. But a little bit later, she hears this terrible screeching noise. And she looks out there, and Johnny's trying to put the cat in a bucket of water. Johnny, what are you doing? I'm trying to baptize our cat. Johnny, cats don't like water. Johnny says, well, he shouldn't have joined my church. <laughs> you should want to be at a church that has expectations. You should want to be at a church where the leaders are trying to be as clear as they can be. This is what we want for you. We want you... To become a fervent, ardent, consistent follower of Jesus. And let Jesus define that word. So here's what you're going to be hearing a lot. Almost every Sunday at our church, you're going to hear this. The Hills Church exists to make and grow followers of Jesus. We do this together by being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and doing what Jesus did. And I think we can remember that. That we go to our church because we want to learn how to be with Jesus and become like Jesus and do more of what Jesus did. That does not mean we're not going to care about the lower room. We're going to continue to provide quality worship, hopefully powerful preaching, good ministry. No, we're going to keep doing those things. What it does mean is we're going to evaluate everything we're doing through the lens of, is it helping people be with Jesus? Become like Jesus and do what Jesus did. By the way, starting with my preaching. I already outlined my preaching for the whole year. And every sermon is going to be through that lens. And focused on one of those three things. Because we've got to keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing is the pursuit of Christ-likeness. And that means also we're going to stop talking about community as just a step you get to. Community is the environment in which you follow Jesus. Jesus never did solo discipleship training. He only taught apprentices in community. You enter the upper room in a congregation, not in isolation. This is one reason why we are so high on rooted groups. We're going to launch them again in February. You'll hear more about it. But in rooted, we learn some of the disciplines that make room for the Holy Spirit to help us become like Jesus. And most of all, what this new strategy means is we're going to be talking a whole lot more about reliance on the Holy Spirit. And I think in next steps, we assumed that, but we didn't assert that. And I know that because I wrote the sermons. And I went back and I looked at them. And in only two of those sermons did I 
mention the Holy Spirit. My bad. So just telling you up front, going forward, we're going to be much more bold about pursuing the Holy Spirit. About being bold in believing in his ministry. We want to be an unashamedly spirit-filled church. Because here's the truth. Only God can help you love God and know God and imitate God. Paul said, 1 Corinthians 12, 3, without the Holy Spirit, you can't even say Jesus is Lord, much less live like it. We want you to follow Jesus. Ordinary people experiencing extraordinary transformation through the power of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, this change is available and possible for anybody. You notice how many times before Jesus said, follow me, he said, come. Whoever wants to be my disciple. No other rabbi did that. You know that. That was the difference between Rabbi Jesus and all the other rabbis. Apprenticeship to Jesus was open to everybody. Fishermen who did not make the cut were invited. Tax collectors who could not even apply were invited. Women who were not even considered were invited. Anyone could apprentice under Rabbi Jesus. But no one could do so without leaving everything behind. In other words, you couldn't follow Jesus just by tweaking your life a little bit. See, Jesus did not offer two versions of discipleship, normal and radical. Do you want normal discipleship? Here's what I expect. I need you to come to church every now and then. I need you to give a little money and don't cuss as much as you used to. But then I, there's also radical discipleship for people who just 24-7 get obsessed about Jesus. No. He just offered one version of discipleship. Be with me. Become like me. And do what I do. He said it's a narrow way. Not because everybody is not invited. It's a narrow way because most people don't want to go that way. Most people want to go their own way. And so we come up with a way that just asks us to accept Jesus. While we go on with our lives the way we've always been living. And what happens is we produce a version of Christianity that expects nothing more than that we all act a little bit nicer. It is an insipid, tepid version of Christianity that Jesus never intended. And it will not reach nations and generations. The church must stop accepting, just accept Jesus. Let me put it like this. Following is not about getting Jesus into your life. You hear that all the time. You just need to accept Jesus into your life. No. It's not about sprinkling Jesus over your life. Following is about getting into his life. Following is about learning to do life the way Jesus does it. You can't stay where you are and expect to get where Jesus is. You got to follow the way. It's the first week of a new year. This is a good time for all of us to do a life assessment. If I spend 2024 doing life the way I spent 2023 doing it, am I going to spend more time with Jesus? Am I going to be more like Jesus? Am I going to do more of what Jesus did? We've normalized a way of doing life no rabbi would tolerate. 
And so each week I'm going to close by asking you a question. And this week's question is, is the way I'm doing life getting in the way of following Jesus? That's what the fishermen understood. <laughs> the way we're doing life would get in the way of us following Jesus. So they left it behind. So in my 50s, I got this crazy idea that I would try to run a marathon. And I did. And I, I kept running ever since. I run three or four times a week. You think, oh, pastor likes running. No, he hates running. He likes pizza. Pastor likes pizza. The only way I can eat pizza at my age is I have to go burn some calories. But I appreciate stories about people who took up running at a late age like I did. And this is one of my favorites. Her name was Joy Johnson. Joy decided at the age of 59 to start running. She started running 20 to 50 miles a week. She would average three marathons a year. She ran the New York City Marathon 25 times. In fact, she became a friend of Al Roker, and every year he would interview her. The picture you see, she's just run her 25th marathon at the age of 86. She did it in under eight hours. She fell at mile 20. You see that she has her head bandaged, talked to Al, went to her hotel room. She laid down, and she never woke up. She died with her running shoes on. I want to be like Joy Johnson. I want to die doing what I'm most passionate about. Pursuing my rabbi. Chasing my rabbi. Going wherever my rabbi Goes so I can learn to do life the way my rabbi does. That's what I want you to say about me. He died chasing his rabbi. Rabbi Jesus is saying to every one of you, Come, follow me. Don't just sprinkle me into a crowded life, don't just accept that a couple of things about me are true. Come be with me. Come let me teach you how you can be like me. Come let me show you how to do what I did. Come. Follow me. And some will say, no way. And some will say, that is the best possible way to live. What do you say? So, Father, would you bless this message and this whole month of messages? Because we don't want, when we invite people to Jesus, we don't want to say or expect anything less than he did. And we know Lord Jesus did not come, take on a body, live a sinless life, and die on a cross so that we could just tweak things a little bit. But he came to lead us into a radically new way of doing life. So give us, God, great passion to chase after our rabbi. Knowing it's going to make us different. Knowing it's going to be costly. And believing. Because our rabbi is so good, it would be the best possible way. We could live. And we ask all this in his name. Amen.